This pandemic has imposed a unique set of challenges on the economy and on companies like Citigroup. Mike, as you look into the future, what would you say is the biggest challenge you face now? Eric, uh, hello. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, I would without a doubt say it's the uncertainty, right? As we look at this pandemic, and again, this is a health crisis that has manifested itself into an economic crisis, is what we don't know. There's still so much unknown about the health challenges and therefore how this will play forward and what the ensuing economic challenges will be. Given what Citigroup went through in the financial crisis, Mike, it's hard not to make comparisons. What lessons are you drawing from that experience and applying now? Well, I think one is that we've got to recognize that this is not at its core an economic crisis. This is a health crisis. And I think the, the great news is that not only Citi, but much of the financial system has gone into this from a position of strength. From our, our, our place, it's capital, it's liquidity, it's business model, uh, all of those things. And the investments that we've made in technology and infrastructure, um, so far have served us really well. And uh, again, we're here in a different role this time as opposed to being at the center of the challenges. I think we're playing a very constructive role, not just in terms of our normal role in terms of being a bank, but when you think about the extraordinary actions that not just the US Federal Reserve or US Treasury have done, but central banks and finance ministries around the world. That we've played a very important role in terms of that transmission mechanism from unprecedented monetary and fiscal actions and getting those and bringing those to life for the real economy. So I, I hope and believe that we've played a very constructive role thus far in this challenge. You had a front row seat the last time around, Mike. Are there mistakes that Citigroup made during the financial crisis that, that as a result you're able to avoid this time? Well, I think one is if you look at, at our company, our bank today, you know, we describe ourselves as a, a simpler, stronger institution today. And that when you look at the things we do, I think we've uh, very much um, focused our business around uh, two key, our institutional and our consumer business. And again, we've simplified what we do. So we go into this, I think from a position of strength of not only capital liquidity, I think, but of sanctity of business model and, uh, and the commitments that we have to our customers and clients. Six weeks ago, about six weeks ago, I would say when Citi reported first quarter earnings, the mood, as you'll recall, was dark, right? More than 500, New Yorkers were dying every day. Most of the country was locked down. How much better do things look now? Well, I, you know, again, I think we have, I think the actions, the healthcare actions or the health actions taken around the globe in terms of distancing, in terms of the protocols, in terms of shutdowns have, in my opinion, clearly bent the curve and uh, had real tangible benefits. I think the, the, the question now is that as we start to come out of this, and again, as you think about the phases, Eric, that you know, we're moving from what I would des describe as, uh, as containment, moving back towards stabilization. And as we come out of containment into stabilization to make sure in fact that we don't see, as we've seen in some places that spike back up. And so as we move through that, I think there's some optimism in terms of where we are, in terms of the trajectory of cases and spreading. I think there's more optimism since that time frame that you referenced in terms of advancement, in terms of getting uh, an antivirus or getting a vaccination, which I think is critical as we move to the third stage of normalization that's there. And so I think there's, optimization, um, there's, there's um, um, optimism there. But I think as part of that, that needs to be cautious optimism because again, there's still so much we don't know. Where, what about you personally? You know, where do you, where do you sit on that spectrum of caution to optimism, or I guess if it goes all the way from pessimism to optimism, I note, you know, a, 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 a perhaps a reluctance, Mike, to, to sort of fully embrace this idea that it's, we're going to be back in business and that 
everything's going to be fine. You know, you, you talked a few weeks ago about discounting a V-shaped recovery and being unsure of whether it was going to be U-shaped, W-shaped, L-shaped. What are you thinking right now? Well, again, for me, it's, it's about the data. It's not about a date, right? It's not about setting a date. And I tell our employees all the time, you're not going to wake up one morning or go to bed one evening with a blast email saying, tomorrow's the day, come back that we're taking a very granular approach to this as a global company. Again, as we, as we look at this pandemic, it's uneven in, in its nature in every sense, right? It didn't start at the same time. It hasn't spread at the same rate. We've seen varied healthcare responses. We've seen varied economic and policy responses to it. And therefore, not just in the U.S., but around the world, there's going to be a varied pace of recovery from this. And I think as that, from Citi's perspective, we're going to take a very granular approach around the data and what that data tells us. Uh, and again, I think that um, stealing a, a line that my wife often uses, and that is that while we're all in the same storm, we're certainly not in the same boat. And I think we've got to be very mindful of that. Clearly, Mike, one of the hardest decisions a CEO has to make is when to bring people back to work. Are they going back to the rural desks? Are they going to some new space in the suburbs? Um, will employees be expected to travel or is, I don't know, Zoom the next business class ticket? And if a big client shows up at the front door with a fever, do you welcome him in or do you turn him away? Tell me how you're thinking about those kinds of issues. So I think one is, is that uh, our business model, Eric, has given us some real advantages. And that is that, you know, clearly uh, we've been in Asia, we've been in Asia a long time. And our colleagues there, I think, gave us great insight, right? As we saw and we, we knew that it was likely COVID would be coming West, we had the ability to have the learnings on the ground of what was happening in Asia, what was working and what wasn't. And if you go back and look at the record, I think we were pretty early movers in terms of some of the decisions we made. Overarching since then, it's all been about the health and safety of our people in terms of making sure that we could do everything within our power to ensure that. And so again, as we start to think about returning people to the office, it's gonna be driven by data, as I said. It's likely to be slow, it's likely to be granular, so it will be site by site. And in fact, within those sites, it'll be job by job. And uh, again, I think the great news is that the investments that we've made in technology along the way and the efficacy of which remote working uh, has, has worked for us, um, I think it's nice to have that flexibility. And again, if you look at the things that we've done remotely, it's been truly extraordinary uh, you know, in terms of lending, in terms of holding our annual uh, shareholders meeting, of closing our books uh, to report earnings in nine days. Uh, of the, the things that we've been able to do for our customers and clients. And, and by the way, the things that we've been able to do for the communities that, that we serve uh, in terms of giving back. So give me your best guess. I know it's data-driven. You've been very clear about that, but give me your best guess, Mike. When will you start putting people back into your global headquarters in downtown Manhattan? It's all about, can we bring these people in and keep them safe? And I, I think the protocols that we've been working on and again, it's not simply about a desk or a turret or an office. It's about coming through the turnstile. It's about the cafeteria. It's about the elevators. It's about all of those things that are there that you've got to make sure are safe. And then the, the bigger challenge is actually, I don't think are in phase one. I think it's as, as you continue to bring more people back and densify, how do you actually scale those protocols to, to be able to keep that safety? Is putting traders back on the trading floor priority? Um, listen, uh, you know, there's been a lot of talk in terms of companies saying that people never need to or will return to work. I, I'm very comfortable saying that City, that's not who we are. We are very happy to continue to imagine and reimagine as we go forward the ways we come to work. But, you know, at our, at our core, we are a client-facing, client-driven business that in many ways is, is an, an apprenticeship business, right? And that the, the craft, the trade is passed down and that human interaction is critical. 
Uh, and, and again, I, I'm, I'm a person who I believe we've got to see how this ages. A lot of people talk about, and, and by the way, at City, it's been terrific in terms of remote productivity, but we don't know actually over time what that looks and feels like. And in our business model, I think we're very fortunate of being a 200 plus year old company and having a large number of really well established deep relationships. But over time, I don't know how those things age. And so uh, again, we'll, we'll continue to kind of think about those things. And again, health and safety being number one, but it's my ambition and my goal to, to get our people back into the office safely when we can. What about the need for social distancing and the reluctance that some employees are going to have coming back to densely populated office floors? Yeah. Tell me about some of the things you're thinking about in terms of the percentage of occupancy. You know, will you have 50% of the people you used to have, say, at 38, 388 Greenwich, or maybe less than that for a period of time till the end of the year? I don't know. And, and, and what about opening up, say, satellite locations outside New York City or outside London, for example, for the people who live in the suburbs and, and don't feel comfortable getting on a commuter train or taking the subway? Again, I, I think all of those things are, are very much on the table. But in the conversations that I've had with my colleagues, um, I believe and, and, and I'm, I'm glad that people are where they are in terms of, I think they have trust and confidence in terms of us of doing the right things, of, of providing them with that safe work environment. And I would say candidly, Eric, that the conversations that I'm having are much more about the commute in urban areas. It's getting on the train, it's getting on the subway, uh, it's getting on the bus. Um, and it's probably less about the workspace because again, I think there are things that we can do to create that environment. And I think the biggest hurdle we're gonna have to get by is not getting people to come to the, uh, to, to, to operate in the office, it's getting them to the office. And I think to your point, uh, as was I think out in the press, we are looking at satellite locations such that you know people who might be uncomfortable getting on mass transit for some period of time. And again, I think if I go back to uh, what I think a big um, threshold is gonna be is going to be that vaccine that allows normalization and, and, and allows comfort in, in social density. Um, uh, but until then, I, I think it's gonna be transportation that's gonna be the biggest gating item in terms of our people's concerns. Mike, every CEO I've talked to, both publicly and privately, has said the same thing. We're going to need a lot less real estate when this is over. Are you similarly planning longer term for a future with less square footage and more working from home? Well, we've, we've been on that path, right? We've been on what some people would describe as densification in terms of, of uh, reducing our, our square foot print uh, not just in the U.S., but around the world. And I think technology naturally will continue to drive that. And as I've said, Eric, I'm not one right now who's giving up on the office or the importance of the office for business like ours. And so again, I think we'll continue to be smart about it. We'll continue to push ourselves. We're certainly open to new ideas. But uh, again, we've been on that path and I feel pretty good right now about our real estate footprint and the plan that we have for it as we go into the future. What other kinds of permanent or semi-permanent changes do you anticipate for the way Citigroup operates and the way it does business? So I think, again, I think there's a lot on the table in there. You know, I, I question uh, as, as somebody who's a, a frequent traveler, <clears throat> as we come out of this, what will travel look and feel like? Will it need to be um, as voluminous as it once was? Uh, um, a great example yesterday, I had the opportunity to open up a investment banking conference that we were hosting virtually in our EMEA, in our Europe, Middle East and Africa franchise. We had over hundred clients on, uh, on the call, on the video and um, those types of things where maybe there's just some better ways to think about, think about doing some of these things and will, will those things change? And again, I, I still think that in parts of our business, um, the face-to-face -face meeting uh, when it becomes proper and permissible is still gonna be an important thing, right? We are in a, a, a privileged position of trust. And I, I'd say today we are absolutely operating, but I think over time you need to 
make sure you're continuing to reinvest in that because it's so critical to who we are and the things that we do. It sounds to me like the answer is kind of no, we're not going to need to do as much travel, for example, maybe even commuting as we did before. The future is going to look different, hard to put a finger on it, but the takeaway I'm getting from some of the things you're saying is that that is the direction that that you see the, the firm moving. I think all those things are on the table. And again, we've got to see it's it's early. We're 60 or 90 days into this experiment. So for me, it's too early to declare exactly what it's going to be, other than to say, I think it's very fair to put these things on the table, to work through them and to see. And again, I think it's it's going to take time to, to understand what the benefits of some of these things are. And at the same time, what the downside or what some of the costs or, or, or what some of the drags may be from it. You're a New Yorker, Mike. Do you worry about the future of the city? You know, uh, less urban density doesn't bode well uh, for the tax base, doesn't bode well for bars, doesn't bode well for restaurants, doesn't bode well for Broadway, doesn't bode well for a lot of things that people have come to equate with New York City and the things that have made this, you know, the, the, the thriving center of global capitalism that it is. You know, listen, New York is a, is a incredible place that has phenomenal resiliency. And I've been in and around New York really most if not my whole life. And it's certainly been through its series of challenges and it's rebounded and it's come through and it's changed itself, you know, the way, uh, the way that it's needed to. You know, I was there just a few blocks from the World Trade Center on 9-11 and there were people at that point who were ready to write off downtown. And today, you know, downtown or going into this downtown couldn't have been more vibrant. So I'm a, I'm a believer in New York City and I think New York will continue to reinvent itself in ways that people will continue to enjoy. Mike, City was among the first banks to announce forbearance and payment deferrals uh, for your consumer clients. And you've extended that relief, if I'm not mistaken, three times. Clearly, certainly as far as those people are concerned, and probably for the sake of the broader economy, it was the right thing to do. But from where you sit right now, how is that going to play out? Are those people going to become current again? or is an inevitable percentage just going to end up being delinquent on those mortgages and loans? Yeah. Again, I think we were, we were fortunate given our business model and obviously seeing what had happened in Asia and the things that we did in Asia, we quickly brought that to the US. So sometime just before mid-March, we actually announced our forbearance programs. And again, we're the, the first US bank out there to do that and we've had a number of people. We've had almost a million and a half of our customers come forward saying that they would like to take advantage of those forbearance programs, which I think is, is terrific. Um, on the other side of it, what's interesting is the truly extraordinary actions that we've seen out of Treasury and out of the Federal Reserve, I think have kept some of that pressure off. But if you think about, and we go back to the 08 financial crisis. It was about markets and market stability. It was about housing prices. I think this time what we've really seen is our government entities really focus on business, small business, and in particular jobs and trying to keep people in their jobs and trying to keep people on payrolls. And so while we've put these forbearance programs in place and roughly a million and a half have asked, probably about half of those have actually taken advantage of it to date. And that's fine, the programs are there and we will continue with those programs as long as they are necessary. And I think the, the big question here is how long does this go on and what types of programs? We've heard uh, from our Federal Reserve Chairman that the Federal Reserve is willing to do uh, paraphrasing whatever it takes. And so obviously that's a, a, a pretty good um, uh, lift or, or the, provides a lot of buoyancy under some pretty challenging situations. But the big question goes back to the unknown and how long does this go on? Mike, whatever it takes raises a couple of important questions, at least a couple for people who play as key a role in the financial system as you do and as Citigroup does more importantly. Uh, it's a trite question, but I'll ask it anyway. Without the promise of infinite Fed liquidity, where would financial markets be today? Where would the stock market be 
Would credit spreads be as narrow as they are? Would investment grade bonds be producing a positive return on the year? I would imagine the answer has to be no, but it's the, it's the how much. It, it, that's why I, I turn to somebody as more expert in the matter like you. I think it's hard to, to quantify. You know, the, the number of uh, so-called stimulus that's out there is somewhere in the $2 trillion range. And again, I think the, the Fed and Treasury have been very prescriptive uh, in terms of how that money's been put to work. Again, as we think about the timeline here, we first saw the Federal Reserve come in and really address liquidity concerns in the market. And we had some pretty challenging days there in terms of price action, in terms of volatility, uh, in terms of asset pricing. Uh, we then, as the Fed put its programs in place, and again, if you, if you look at the actual numbers, I think the, the promise or the, um, the um, creation of those programs themselves without necessarily heavy, heavy utilization has provided that safety net or provided that comfort that people have wanted without the Fed actually having to use significant amounts of, that do of those dollars. Second piece was around credit, right? And we saw in March that uh, from our own perspective in the US system, loan demand spiking up, revolvers being drawn, companies understandably wanting to build liquidity. And I think as part of that, we saw the Federal Reserve step in and put programs uh, in place around those money, uh, money market, commercial paper programs, et cetera. And again, without necessarily heavy utilization, that underlying comfort has uh, provided a base to the market. Uh, and now we've seen them move to the third leg to me, which again goes back to really business, small business, lending, payroll protection, and trying to keep people in jobs. So it's very hard to say specifically because there's so many prongs uh, to, what's, to what's in there, but without a doubt, it has uh, created or um, certainly put the market in a, in a much better position than it would have been without. Mike, walk me through some of your thinking about the longer term cost and consequences of these programs, because those are real too, right? The addiction to Fed liquidity, and, and that dates back to before the pandemic, by the way, um, the mushrooming deficit, right, to, to a scale heretofore almost never seen, certainly not in post-war history, the enormity of the Fed's balance sheet. Well, I think there's a few aspects to it, Eric. I think one is, and we're very conscious too, is that you know, we don't want to see consumer, small business, big business come out of this in a indebtedness position that's just unsustainable. And that's why I think you've seen in a number of these programs that they've been structured in a way that they're actually grants or have aspects of forgiveness in them provided the monies are used appropriately. And so the government's thinking about the same thing. We don't want to, to end up with an economy where uh, our, our consumers and our business are just saddled with untenable levels of debt. I think the second piece which you touch on is actually where do the governments come out? And I think we've got to be mindful that going while going into this, uh, the U.S. from a position of strength in terms of the economy, growth rates, employment, um, from a monetary and a fiscal perspective, not without some challenges, right? When you think of the toolbox out there, not just in the U.S., but around the world, low rates, negative rates in some places. And so not a lot of things on the monetary front that can necessarily uh, be used with high, high impact today, which leads us to fiscal and the fiscal programs being put in place in terms of small business lending and payroll protection and Main Street lending programs that are out there. And that clearly will take up the levels or as some people would say, balloon the Fed's balance sheet. And by the way, other balance sheets. And we've gotta be mindful that we do not want uh, our government in the US or other governments to come out in a position where the debt at the, at the the government level, the federal level is, is untenable because again, we're likely to be in this slower growth environment for an extended period of time. And we've got to make sure that we've created that balance in terms of people continuing to have confidence in terms of not just the US government, but governments around the world. So in your mind, how does the government exit as it were? There are some people who say they don't, government doesn't need to, right? Monetize the debt, embrace modern monetary theory. And then there are others who say, as soon as is practical, we're gonna to have to raise corporate taxes, 
We may have to raise tax rate on individuals, certainly wealthy individuals. We're going to have to start to chip away at the mountain of debt that, that, that we've created as a result of doing the right things to fight this crisis. Well, I, you know, again, I think that as you, as you look at this, that um, we've been in this extended period of fairly lax or easy monetary policy, not just in the U.S. and around the world. And if you go back and look at the Fed balance sheet uh, coming out of the last financial crisis, they were on a path, on a trajectory of getting that back down to, I think, levels that people were becoming much more comfortable with. Obviously, with this, we've had to go back in the other direction. And as we um, try to get to the other side of this and hopefully come out in the not too distant future, um, it's going to be back on the table. But as you, you cite, you know, a couple of things that are out there is that one is the U.S. does continue to be the world's preeminent reserve currency. And, you know, when you look at our treasury auctions and others, it has a very strong international borrowing base and therefore has capacity. I think the, the second piece of it, and, and I don't want to be lulled into a false sense of complacency, but the low interest rates impose a very low cost in terms of the U.S. government borrowing to be able to fund these programs that are out there. So, again, I think we've got to be prudent. We've got to be mindful in terms of the absolute and relative levels of our indebtedness. Uh, and we do have to have a trajectory to get it back to a more sustainable level over time. But I, I still think we're, we're in a reasonable place right now. And it goes back to how long this goes on for. And again, what needs will be in the future uh, and what kind of commitments it will take from not just the US, but other governments around the world to be able to support their economies. There's no question the banking system is a whole lot healthier than it was 12 years ago. Uh, and clearly the government, as you pointed out, is relying on big banks to help distribute aid and to stabilize the financial markets. Um, the economy though, Mike, clearly is still reeling. We're going to have high unemployment for the foreseeable future. At what level? Hard to say, but it's certainly not going to be sub 4%. Um, consumers and corporate borrowers are going to default and they're going to default in large numbers are banks really that healthy when you think about how the credit cycle is going to play out? Well, you, if you kind of look at where we are, and again, I'll, I'll speak to Citi, that we came into this um, health crisis from a position of strength in terms of capital. You know, we had uh, finishing the year 11.8% uh, tier one common equity capital uh, on our balance sheet. Again, in the support of our clients, we used a bit of that in terms of the first quarter. And we will likely continue to use some of that excess capital as we go forward, but we're mindful. And again, we've said, I think very clearly and honestly that we don't know how long this will go on for. We don't know exactly what the path will, will be like. And so we've gotta be very, very mindful uh, of that. I think the US system uh, like city comes into this from a position of strength. And uh, as part of that, we, in the first quarter, you saw us build, uh, again, as a company and as an industry, considerable reserves. We built almost $5 billion of additional reserves. We've got about $23 billion of reserves right now set aside. Uh, and again, we'll continue to watch as we go forward. And as you can imagine, uh, the calculations and the modeling that we do remains very sensitive to unemployment. It remains very sensitive to GDP, to housing prices. And so as we continue to look at what we think the future trajectories are of those, we'll continue to make appropriate decisions around reserving into the future. So uh, again, a position of strength, I think trying to be prudent, smart about it, making sure we're there and the important things to support our clients, but being mindful in terms of capital and capital trajectory into the future. The last time around during the financial crisis or after the financial crisis, it took some 18 months, Mike, before City, City was able to stop building additional reserves for you know, potentially bad loans. Do you think it'll take that long this time? Again, we don't know the trajectory of this, mm. Eric. I, you know, I talked about the, the stages in terms of containment, in terms of stabilization, in terms of normalization, and, and eventually back to growth. And uh, I think in this, stabilization will be an important thing that we actually have gotten through this. And uh, we've been able to, to start to bring things back 
more towards the norm and not have increases in cases. And then really what I wanna see is the return to normalization. And, and in there, uh, we don't know as we go into the fall here in the US whether or not uh, some of the healthcare experts are right or not that we may see a resurgence. So again, from our perspective, um, we're gonna keep a watchful eye towards that. And, uh, and again, take it, take it as it comes and, and you know, try and make sure that we're there to support our clients as we go through this. City Mike has a large and historic business in Asia, but at the same time, a lot less at stake in China than some other foreign banks. I'd like to know if you're reconsidering some of your expansion plans there in light of the tensions, and, and I think it's fair to say growing mistrust in the West of China's intentions. Well, you know, Asia, Asia is a place where we've been coming to work for over a century, and it's an important part of our global network. And clearly, China is a, is a big and important piece of that. And again, when you think about the places where we come to work every day and where we're a bank, we don't wake up one day and say, gee, don't we want to be in these places? We listen to the places that are important to our clients and the things that they want to do. And I think China is a big economy. It's an important economy. It's an important place for many, many, many of the U.S. multinational companies. And as part of that, we want to make sure that we're there to support them. Um, so, no, Asia is an important place. We're committed uh, to Asia. And China remains a very important place for a big number of our clients. And so we're going to make sure we're there to support them. Uh, Rahm Emanuel famously said, never allow uh, a crisis go to waste. Uh, something along those lines, Mike. But what's more important is asking you, how are you taking advantage of the opportunities? I would describe them as that only possible because of a crisis like this. I think one of the big things, Eric, that has come out of this is what I would describe as a even faster acceleration of the move to digital. And as a company, we've been making significant investments over the past several years. And by the way, I think it's through this crisis served us extremely well. But when you look at, as an example, our heroes that have uh, continued throughout this every day to go into our branches, branch traffic is down 40 or 50 percent. Cash usage is down. And so we've seen digital, uh, digital application usage up. And again, not just up around people who have been active users in the past, we're bringing new users in. So to me, I think it's exciting and I'm sure we're gonna get some great lessons and already have in terms of what the future of that is and actually how do we accelerate that, right? We've known that we've been on this path from analog to digital and it was tough to, to really discern what that timeline would look like. I think without a doubt, this has accelerated it and at City, how do we actually get behind that and make sure that we're pushing the things that people really want? And by the way, it's not just in our consumer business, it's in our trading businesses. It's in our transaction service businesses. It's in our private bank and it's across the board. So again, putting on the table and continuing to imagine and reimagine the ways we come to work and the things that we can do for our customers and clients around the world. So whether it's 12 months from now or five years from now, how are people going to look back on this and say, that's what Citi did differently. That's what Citi did differently from other banks. And that's what Mike Corbett as a CEO did differently from other CEOs, what will they say? Well, I, I hope they say, you know, we came into this from a position of strength and then not just as a bank, but from a broader uh, economic perspective, we went out of our way to support. And I'm really proud of what our people have done and the way we've supported our clients, but the way we've supported our communities. We've been very active, not just in the US, around the world, uh, we've already contributed uh, either in dollars or in kind over a hundred million dollars uh, of aid into uh, uh, protective equipment. We've repurposed some of our cafeterias into providing uh, over 35,000 meals in a, in a world where food safety is so critical. And that uh, city went into this strong, they came out of it strong. The investments that they made in their infrastructure uh, served them well, uh, and they are our bank of choice as we go forward. Mike, you've been generous with your time. Thank you, always great to see you. Thanks for having me, stay safe. You too.